This is one of the most important human studies that's ever been published surrounding sucralose, surrounding diet sodas in general. It's wild. Okay, this was just published in 2025. So what if diet soda or even the sweetener that you're putting in your coffee was actually hijacking your brain's hunger signals and telling it to crave more food? It sounds kind of counterintuitive because we've really been told for all kinds of years, like cut the sugar, use the sweetener, save the calories, lose the fat. And it makes sense because insulin can be problematic if we're having a lot of sugar. I get it. And artificial sweeteners and natural sweeteners, they don't have the same insulin spike. But the science is starting to paint a much, much more complicated picture. There was a brand new powerful study that just came out in 2025, just a couple of months ago. It's been blowing the lid off of what we thought we knew. So it's not just another opinion piece because when you get into a lot of the diet soda discussion, a lot of it comes down to opinion or microbiome, which can be very vague and difficult to just understand because we don't know much about the microbiome. This isn't opinion. This is a solid human study. So in this video, we're diving deep into the neurology. So we're looking at the actual brain scans. And what we're finding based on these studies is that your brain on sucralose is a very different brain than the one on sugar. And that difference could be the key to why you're still struggling. So let's go ahead and break it down. So this new study in the journal Nature Metabolism, which is a pretty prestigious journal. So they wanted to finally get a clear answer on sucralose. And that's the main ingredient in Splenda. You see it in all kinds of different baked goods and sodas and whatnot. And we wanted to see how it affected the brain's appetite regulation. So for a number of years, we've been seeing obesity rates skyrocket alongside the use of the sweeteners. And you see people online fighting all the time. Okay, well, one says it's causing them to gain weight. It's spiking insulin through what's called a cephalic insulin response. You see other people talking about how, you know, it causes you to reduce calories, that's all that matters. But we see associations in big population studies that show one way or the other. But the hard randomized controlled trial data on weight gain has been, I mean, it's really been fuzzy to say the least. So it makes for great content because it's a constant debate. So these researchers said enough of this. So they designed a study to overcome the old limitations. They didn't just use a small group of healthy people. They recruited 75 young adults across the spectrum. So we had healthy weight, overweight, they had individuals with obesity, and they included both men and women, which is really important because in a little bit, we're going to talk about how that actually affects affected the study, which is super wild. So here's what they did. They used a powerful tool. It's called fMRI. It's where they're actually able to look directly at the hypothalamus, directly at the brain. So think of the hypothalamus as the master control center for your appetite and really for your metabolism. It's the boss. So when activity goes up, you get hungrier. When it calms down, you feel satisfied. Plain and simple. They gave each person in the study one of three drinks on different days. So they gave them one with sucralose, one with real sucrose, and one that was just plain water. Then they watched what happened in their brains in literal real time. What they found is a complete game changer. There were four main findings that you ultimately need to hear that they found. So first, compared to both sugar and water, the sucralose drink significantly cranked up the activity in the hypothalamus. This is the hunger center and it lit it up like a Christmas tree. Secondly, the part Participants reported feeling significantly hungrier after the sucralose drink compared to the sugar drink, literally more than the sugar drink. So the brain scans match the real world feeling, which is what's wild. Then third, and this is the crucial missing piece and where it gets kind of twisted. And sometimes people would take this section of the study and they'd kind of throw it in your face because it is confusing. So the sugar drink caused the expected spike in blood glucose, spike in insulin, and a powerful satiety hormone, which we know of. It's called GLP-1. The sucralose drink nothing. It was the same as drinking water. No hormonal, I'm full signal or anything. No insulin, nothing. Which makes it sound like, well, I guess it's not really problematic because it didn't do anything to the actual metabolic side of things. But there's another piece that we need to look at too in just a second. The effect wasn't the same for everyone. Women actually had a stronger brain response to sucralose than men did. And people with obesity responded significantly more strongly to sucralose compared to water. So what this study shows is seriously a profound mismatch. When you taste something sweet, your brain has been wired for millions of years to expect one thing, calories, right? Energy is on its way. So with real sugar, that's exactly what happens. Okay, you taste the sweet, the sugar gets absorbed, and your gut releases hormones like insulin and GLP-1, and those travel to the brain and they say, message received, ultimately. The calories are here, you can turn down the hunger signals now, and the hypothalamus calms down. But with sucralose, the first part of that entire signal happens, but the second part never comes. You're just there waiting for the bus forever, right? So your tongue tells your brain incoming energy, but then crickets, like no glucose arrives, no insulin spike, no GLP-1. 
This is clearly an issue, and I think that we've speculated that this happens, but we didn't have the data to back it up, because we saw it in mice, which we're going to talk about in a second. And we're going to talk about some other ways that this connects, but also things that you can do. I'm going to give you one thing that you can do right now. One of the ways to combat some cravings is to have salt. And I've talked about this before. When you start looking at the neuroscience, we have NST neurons in our brain. So salt, like if you even have like some electrolytes, it can curb the cravings, even if it's somewhat sweet. So a lot of times when we're craving sweet, we're craving salt. So I recommend having like some salt or some salty electrolytes. I put a link down below for the ones that I use. Helps a ton when you're fasting or when you're calorically deprived, where you're trying to just reduce calories in general. So that is called Element. And that link gets you a free sample variety pack with any purchase. Okay, so with any purchase, you get a free pack of electrolytes that you can keep for yourself, you can give to your friends. It's a pack of their leading flavors. So this is cool because you're getting kind of a freebie with it, but I'm telling you with a thousand milligrams of sodium, it does curb your appetite. I can say firsthand, I've been using it for seven years, like when I fast or when I'm reducing calories, game changer. So try adding something like that in if you're trying to reduce calories instead of maybe a diet soda. It's a good alternative. So if we think of the brain as sort of a computer, remember we're getting the signal, but we're not actually getting the package, right? It's like we got a delivery notification, but the package never showed up. So neurologically, it's called a prediction error. So the brain predicted calories, but it got none. So what does it do? It doesn't just give up. That's not how the brain works. It activates the hunger circuits even more, screaming, hey, where are the calories you promised me? I need to find some now. And this could be the very mechanism that drives cravings and pushes you to seek out real food later on, completely negating the calories that you thought you saved. So you're creating like a break in the critical gut-brain circuit that calibrates your appetite to begin with. Giving credit where credit's due, I know what you're thinking. It was a short-term study. So did it even measure long-term weight gain? I mean, that's a really fair limitation to look at, but we can connect the dots using other research. So first, let's take a look at the gut. So there was a study that was published in the Frontiers of Physiology. It was an interesting one. I did a video on it a while back. It looked at what six months of sucralose consumption did to mice. So they used a dose that was equivalent to like the human acceptable daily intake. They found in this case, it dramatically altered the gut microbiome. So it led to a big increase in pro-inflammatory bacteria, and it ultimately led to inflammation that even showed up in the liver. But this was in mice, so people didn't really take it 100% serious. But what does inflammation in the liver and a disrupted gut have to do with weight? Well, pretty much everything. So it can lead to impaired insulin signaling, which brings me to the next piece of the puzzle. So this one was a study that was published in the Nutrition Journal, and it took healthy adults and it had them consume sucralose for 10 weeks. So afterwards, they gave them a glucose challenge test. So they tested their tolerance, how well they could handle glucose. The results after this, after just 10 weeks of sucralose, their bodies had to pump out significantly more insulin to handle the exact same amount of sugar. So literally pumping out more insulin to handle the same amount of sugar. That is a textbook sign of developing a resistance to insulin. Your glucose tolerance goes down. You're becoming less efficient at handling carbohydrates. And when your insulin is chronically high, your body is in that fat storage mode. You can see the chain reaction here, right? So essentially, it's starting with this prediction error in your brain. And then over time, that mismatch just leads to a disrupted gut microbiome. And that disruption creates inflammation, which ends up impairing your body's ability to handle sugar. And that pushes you towards insulin resistance and ultimately makes it harder to lose fat and easier to gain it. But it actually gets kind of crazier when you look at older research too, because this has kind of been around a little while. So there is this old meta-analysis in QJM, and it found this observational link between artificially sweetened drinks and obesity risk. We now have the powerful plausible mechanisms to explain why that link may exist. And again, this isn't just simple stuff anymore. Like we need, we start to understand this is affecting the brain. It's not just this cephalic insulin response that we used to think it was. And it's not just about the sucralose molecule itself just hanging around, because realistically, there's studies in both mice and humans that show that most of it is excreted pretty quick. It's about the faulty signals that it's sending to the brain. So it's not that sucralose is bad as a molecule. It's sucrose with a chlorine molecule. Like it's not that bad and it's excreted quick, but it's the constant deception of your body's basic ancient metabolic pathways. So my takeaway for you is this. We need to be mindful, okay? Because free sweetness is not really free. There's no free rides and it comes at a metabolic cost. So if you can stick to the whole foods, if you need sweetness, 
use sources that your body understands as much as you can. Now, we're starting to see some data even with stevia and monk fruit, but these don't seem to do the same thing quite so much. Okay, sucralose is very, very sweet. One that I would particularly recommend is allulose because allulose is not as sweet as sugar and it actually kind of overrides in a metabolic way and it helps take extra sugar and drop the blood sugar a little bit more. So allulose is really interesting, also increases GLP-1 and satiety. So allulose when you can, stevia, monk fruit, those are decent. Aspartame, moderation, sucralose, moderation, and People are gonna hate me for saying this, but aspartame may even be slightly safer than sucralose in some ways because it doesn't have the same impact on the gut microbiome. But again, I shouldn't even say that, but the reality is that you probably should limit all of them. See, I treat them as like a moment of indulgence. When I had Dr. Ben Bickman, the world's like leading insulin scientist, he said the same thing. They're not the end of the world because they don't affect insulin, but it is affecting your brain. So if you're not clicked in with your brain signals, it's gonna take you for a ride guarantee it. That's why people that are fit, people that are healthy, like they say diet soda is no problem because they can control their hunger cravings more. Regular people, like I was really overweight before. I know what that feels like to have my hunger signals hijacked. I did a video on the best sweeteners to use when you're fasting and just in general. It breaks it down pretty good. So I'll link out to this one here. It's an old one, but it's a great one. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.